decided finally uh, to speak in, um, in Vermont. Uh, I did a presentation and was flown out from California College and University's uh, Sustainability Conference in uh, Long Beach uh, uh, last June. And there was about uh, uh, 700 different uh, sustainability coordinators from different colleges there. Uh, uh, got invited to speak down to the CES show in Las Vegas in, in January. And there's a lot of people who've been curious about this idea about fair trade recycling. Um, and uh, believe it or not, Vermont seems to be the hub uh, where, where the idea is um, uh, blossoming. And uh, it's our hope that uh, fair trade recycling will do for Vermont what fair trade coffee did. Uh, and uh, fair trade coffee, if you're not familiar with it, that's where I'm going to start my segue. Uh, I've been an environmentalist since uh, uh, high school. And I got into uh, recycling when I was studying the environment. Who, who knows, there's one uh, industry which um, uh, creates 47% of all toxics created by all USA industry. Does anybody know what that is? No. Good guess. Automotive? No. It's a good guess, too. It's more than plastic, more than automotive. Uh, uh, Clinton and Babbitt uh, released a report saying that it was 47% of all toxics. And uh, when, when Bush came in and had his people at Department of Interior take a look at it, they wanted to study that figure, and they, they released the new official figure of 45% of all toxics. Cosmetics? No. It's, uh, if you think about it, the more valuable something is, the more you can predict people will do, chemically, carbon, that they will do to get it. And if you think about what's the most valuable thing that we have, well, it's gold. Uh, gold, uh, actually all the hard rock metals, gold, silver, and copper. If you think about yourself, if you were on Survivor and you had to go find if you had to make paper, you could imagine beating it out of a tree and pulping it. You could imagine making a lot of things, but uh, the metals that are inside the rocks that are mined are only about 1 or 2% of, of the rocks, and they will pull out entire mountains, treat them with cyanide. Uh, and uh, I read about that uh, back in, uh, in high school, as I said, in the 70s, and I thought, well, geez, these, these mines are most of our pollution. Uh, it's uh, the nuclear power industry in Arkansas, where I grew up, was built for bauxite mining to get aluminum uh, out of there. It ran the whole uh, uh, nuclear power plant. I thought, what can I do to make a difference? So I, I decided to get into recycling. Um, because it seems something concrete you can know at the end of the day that you can measure in pounds. And if you kind of imagine uh, how much waste and rocks and forest it would have taken to make that aluminum can. Uh, you can feel good about yourself by recycling, and I, I chose that as a career a long time ago. But in between, I did something, which is where I was going to start here with, uh, which was, you know, like a number of you might know someone who's done this, uh, join the Peace Corps. Uh, uh, I went to, uh, I did my training in uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, visited Rwanda, Rwanda and Burundi, and then was stationed in Cameroon. And I'll just show you some pictures about what life was like, because it's going to help you understand how I approached e-waste when I came back to the U.S. and why fair trade coffee makes makes sense. Uh, if you just look at these people, you know these were the the kids in my my compound. Uh, this was uh, a guy who'd been uh, with the British Army in World War II. Um, one of my students at the high school, more students. And you spend a lot of time, there's no TV, no internet, looking at your students and thinking 15 years from now, if I come back and I meet any of these kids, what are they likely to be doing for a living? You know, uh, uh, we, we organize, these are some of the other teachers, um, friends. You, you spend day after day and looking at the kids, spending all this time, you really start to think about what are the choices that they've got? Where are they going to work? I mean, maybe they're going to, if you're real lucky, they might become a teacher. You know, uh, uh, that's at least one job that's working for government where there's a slight chance that 15 years 
later, uh, they might be someone you still like. Most of the jobs going into government, well, they pay well and would take care of your students. Uh, most of those government jobs in Africa don't turn people into uh, the kind of people that you would hope that they would become. Uh, well, they, they could go into agriculture, you know, and that's, that's a very honorable career. You know, nothing wrong with it. Uh, they work very hard, and they tend to die by the age of 50, 55. Um, they're not going to own very much in their lives. They're going to not, if their kids get a disease, they won't be able to uh, treat it. Um, but, you know, there, there's nothing wrong with the agriculture. So government, agriculture, then somebody would say, well, maybe Nike will come build a factory. And a big Western corporation, that's the secret. That's where these kids are going to get their jobs. Um, that didn't really excite me. Um, you know, Nike, when they did open a factory in Nigeria uh, next door to us in Cameroon, banned the importation of used shoes as one of the conditions for them to open the factory, which I always found kind of shocking. And that's going to be a recurring theme uh, as we get into e-waste. But if you name the different jobs that African kids like this might have, none of those are really as bad as some of the jobs you can probably think about. Uh, child soldier, uh, uh, prostitute. They could be uh, mining for coal tailing in some of these mines that we're talking about, you know, digging out the rare earth metals from the Amazon, uh, getting gold out with mercury, which they burn off to get the gold. There's a lot of jobs that um, they could have. Um, what I found was that if I could really imagine one of my students, who was one of the smartest kids with just his mind, what he might do. If you think about it, with just learning how to fix a cell phone or learning how to fix a laptop, which somebody else has thrown out, that you can with your own mind by learning these circuits and doing things that we used to do here in this country, turn with one hour of work, $300, of, you know, three months worth of, of income, just with what you know in your head. And so when I came back to the States, uh, I got into the environment. I became a recycling director for the state of Massachusetts. We designed the first e-waste collection laws in, in the United States. And the thing I was the most interested in was the amount of the material that's being thrown away that still works or could be repaired, but Americans just want something. So with that, I'll go to the, the presentation um, because about 10 years ago when I came back and I decided I was going to leave working for the state, follow my wife to uh, Middlebury College and, uh, where she'd gotten a job, I would leave my, my secure state job with 21 staff and uh, uh, a big office on Winter Street. I would start an actual e-waste collection business and my dream was to trade with techs like some of the people that you know might have been my students back in Cameron. What I came face to face with was a massive campaign to stop and ban and shred, to completely stop all electronics trade with the third world. And to me, it struck me that when I came back from Cameron, uh, and this was in the 80s, that there was a lot of hubbub about uh, how little money the coffee farmers made when they picked the beans and we paid a dollar, you know, how, how few pennies of a dollar for a cup of coffee went to the farmers, and somebody had the idea, let's boycott coffee. And those of us who just returned from the Peace Corps, that seemed like such a strange and crazy bad idea to help farmers by boycotting their products. You know, it's like my hair wanted to catch on fire. But when I came back and started this job of, hey, I'm going to find whatever percentage of the material still works and be prepared, and the onslaught in the American press saying, no, it's going to be burned by children. It's toxic. It's polluted. This is where I came up with the idea, well, let's, let's interview people over there. Let's fly overseas. Let's take pictures, talk to them face to face, study how much junk got over there, and then see if we can design something similar to fair trade coffee, where we can preserve the best of those jobs without uh, dumping waste on them. 
Uh, the association that we formed, uh, the World Reuse, Repair, and Recycling Association, it's incorporated here in Vermont. Uh, we've just changed the name to Fair Trade Recycling. Uh, but its mission is to reform the recycling export market rather than you know boycott it. Fly over, find out what it is that people are buying, what they need, how they're doing, dealing with it, and giving them the incentives to uh, deal with it correctly. The uh, means are contracts, uh, certification, uh, reconciliation reports, truth and transparency. Really find out if what is being exported really is going to function and do the right thing, or if it's just a, a way to get rid of something that you don't want to deal with. Uh, the members are generators, uh, universities, um, uh, colleges, uh, uh, nonprofits, uh, recyclers, and a lot of our members are overseas companies. And I'll be introducing you to some of those in the slideshow. Um, what we really, what I believe as a former regulator is that if you really believe that the environment gets better because environmental police run around arresting people for polluting, you really don't understand very well how it works. Uh, most environmental enforcement is driven by property values. The, that's why uh, all of the, there were seven secondary copper smelters that produced copper from recycled copper in 1960. All seven were closed, even though they saved more pollution than primary smelting out of the mountain. It's because the ones that we're dealing from mountain derived copper are far away from everybody. There's no property values, but the recycling smelters tended to be in cities like Chicago and, and New York, and so any pollution was, uh, was unacceptable. What, what really drives uh, improvements are not getting sued, uh, uh, entering into agreement that you won't poison people, knowing that if you do poison people, you're going to, to pay the piper. So what WR3A does is, is signs contracts where if somebody overseas doesn't want something and they're not supposed to get it, that they have a clause in their contract to complain about it and get paid to take care of it responsibly. Um, uh, and I'll show you some of the reconciliation reports. The uh, main members that we have behind us right now are universities that have their own surplus property programs. What, it, what I found uh, really resonates is that um, when I give a presentation like this to Cornell, and, at Cornell, and there were uh, uh, 200 students in the background, and I showed some of the slides that I talked about. At the end of the presentation, there's like 12 people coming down to meet me from Indonesia and from Argentina and from South Africa, saying, thanks, man, we are so tired, sir, of hearing these stories about how primitive we are and that we pay $20 for computers in Burma. We're, we're exhausted. Thank you for you know, treating us as equals. And at the universities we've found, they've got a lot of surplus property they have a lot of environmentalists to hold our feet to the fire if we're not doing what we say we're doing. And they have a lot of roots in the countries that we trade with. So uh, if, some, if there's a dispute about what's going on in Indonesia, you know, some, somebody in my team speaks Indonesian. is going to find somebody to find out whether the slides I'm going to show you are real or not. Um, when I present on this, the main topic has been display needs because we love our displays, we love new displays. Displays have nothing to do with Moore's Law, if you've ever heard of it, that they say is the reason why computers go obsolete. There's nothing inside a CRT monitor that goes obsolete in three years. There's nothing in a 15-inch monitor that stops working, that forces you to buy a 21-inch monitor. The turnover in display units, which are about 50% the cost of something like a laptop or a computer, is purely driven by we can afford something flatter, we can afford something newer. And so we found that just thousands and tens of thousands of these things were getting turned in to the e-waste collection sites here in the US. And that's where I started you know, researching this to see if it would work. Um, CRTs especially, uh, when we got started, when I got started in this about 10 years ago, they were just coming out of the office buildings almost all still working, uh, but even if they weren't working, you, you really could find out how to repair them or whether they were worth repairing with a few simple tricks that the repair guys taught us. And what we found out was that what I call 3B3K, 
was the market that was buying these things. Okay, 3B, 3K. Um, okay, let's say there's about 7 billion people in the world. Okay, of the 7 billion people, about how many billion do you think can afford a uh, $1,000 computer over three years? I guess maybe a billion. You know, OECD is 1.3 billion people, um, and not everyone in the OECD can do that. But there's about a billion of the 7 billion people that don't want to use equipment. They're generating. Then at the bottom half of the 7 billion people, there's about 3 billion people that they don't need a computer. You know, they're dodging bullets. They are dealing with malaria. They're dealing with um, uh, lots of things that, you know, they're going to have to get electricity before they really need it, a new computer. And those poorest people, you know, I agree, are really not a computer exporting to them is probably not what they need. Now, in between that richest billion people that doesn't want to use a computer, is generating them, and the three billion poorest. That leaves about three billion people. And guess what? Over the past 10 years, those people are getting online at 10 times the rate of the richest billion. They are on fire. And when they saw Americans throwing out these CRTs, these 17-inch computer monitors, which to them, was the difference between if they could get one of those for $20 and have a computer versus, no, why don't you go buy an LCD for, you know, at the time they were $300. I mean, there's no consideration. So we found that the places buying those things, and this shows you the, over the past decade, the um, uh, wealth is in blue and the rate of growth of internet access is in red that the countries which are earning you know, about $3,000 per person per year, those are the big markets. And even when you say countries, it's not really countries, it's cities. Um, uh, if, if you go overseas, you'll find that uh, places like Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and uh, Hong Kong, which is this mega city that's grown into itself in China, um, it's got the population of Japan just in that mega city. And they've got office buildings and people doing all kinds of stuff. And it's just a completely different country than if you go 600 miles to the west, west of China. Um, but anyway, uh, as a, uh, I had a degree in international relations and studied these countries, and I thought, you know what? They're doing exactly what I would dream that my Peace Corps kids were doing. Uh, yeah, they're mining. Yeah, they're pumping oil. But if you've heard of the resource curse, the curse of resources, um, the countries that actually discover the most wealth that way have the worst track record for actually developing. And if you go to the countries that have done the most, the fastest, Singapore, Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, there's a book called uh, The History of Japan, A Network of Tinkers, that talks about how the whole Japanese economy came from radio repair guns that were taking radios from the US um, uh, uh, just before and after World War II, salvaging them, learning how to make it faster, and how that became the economy that makes Toshiba and Sony and Panasonic and all these brands. And that's what, when I followed the trail of where these uh, UCRTs were going, it was clear from the purchase orders that, um, it was clear from the purchase orders that they, uh, what they were asking for, when you go online and people are buying, some of the places were buying 50,000 of these things a week, if they could get them. And they would say, nothing made by Trinitron. You know, nothing made by Sony. We won't pay for those at all. Dell will pay, you know, if it's this type, this size, $7 for this type, $22 for that type. And it was clear from what they were describing that they weren't setting them on fire. Because you could have two of the exact same ones, and they would say, well, check out the implosion. If there's a phosphor damage in the center of the screen, that means the tube's been imploded. We don't repair those anymore. We won't pay you for it. But the exact same model, HR77, same size, oh, we'll pay you $22 for that. It was crystal clear from the purchase orders that these people were not burning these, like the, like the pictures. 
Otherwise, why would they care whether this thing was in this condition? So anyway, this is my factory down in Middlebury. Uh, now I've got 35 employees and 50,000 square feet. But that didn't happen all at once. That took me uh, 10 years. And part of how I grew this business was by going over there and finding for myself whether these were primitive wire burning monkeys or not. And I found, you know, they're good business people. And if you do deal with the right ones, you can do a lot. Now I'm going to show you some slides, some of the people we've had in Middlebury. Uh, this is uh, Frédéric Sanda, who Adelaide, uh, our intern from France, just met in Montreal. He was the Attorney General of Burkina Faso. He came and did a six-month intern with us, internship with us in Middlebury, studying international law and trying to make the case that the Basel Convention does allow export for repair. And he found a segment of it where it explicitly allows it. Um, this is a gentleman I hope we'll meet in uh, three days. He's one of the repair people that works for a women-owned business in Lima, Peru. Her name is Hinex. Uh, she buys certain types of TVs because, and that's another lesson of how you can tell a lot from the purchase order, American TV bandwidth only works in certain countries like Venezuela, Peru, Dominican Republic. And if you try to sell an American TV, working or no, in Brazil, they won't buy it because Brazil uh, uses the uh, French CCAM system, you know, for, for bandwidth. So you start to find out that they know all this technical stuff. They're asking all these questions about the TV, and you find if you sort the type that they want, that they'll pay you for them, and that there's certain ones they don't want to pay you even a penny for. Them. And anyway, uh, Genex has got a women-owned company and has all these guys working for her, and I'm going to see her in three days. And she only corresponds with her purchase orders through Facebook, and she always seems to be at a disco. This is a, a place I visited in uh, Jaipur, Baru, uh, Malaysia, where I asked the um, taxi driver to um, take me to buy some used computers. He took me to a building which had, when I got off, I thought, geez, I thought his English was good. It's not as good as I thought, because this is a shopping mall with escalators and music and uh, brand new LCDs and stuff. Oh, well, I'll go ahead and look, and then I'll try to find where the used computers were. You go up the escalator, go up two floors, and the shopping mall was full of second-hand computers. Uh, this is uh, uh, some folks from Peru. Um, this, likewise, uh, Egypt, one of my favorite places that I've sold to. Um, I sold 30,000 computers to Egypt between uh, 2002 and uh, 2008. And boy, Hamdi, my partner there, was picky. Boy, he, he was a tough negotiator. He was a Mediterranean. If we didn't send the right number of mice, he, we called him the abacus. You know, and somehow, no matter how we packed the container, he would be back with a report showing exactly how many sticks of RAM we were short and what we owed him. But when I go over there, I find that he's a guy in his 20s uh, who had been in medical school with his brother. They're Palestinians, and like many people that are you know, chased out of the land. All the kids wound up going into higher education. So they were both in medical school, but they fixed, they were tinkerers fixing computers, and he and his brother figured out that all the knocks on the door from the other students wanting them to fix their computers, they'd make more money if they sold computers to other doctors and hospitals. Mm -hmm. If you know the story of Michael Dell, that's the same story. That's what my, uh, that's how Michael Dell came. came. And uh, Hamdi uh, took me, he had 22 employees. I brought my wife and kids there. He and his brother in their early 20s uh, showed us exactly how they repair each monitor, exactly the types they can't deal with, working or not. And uh, uh, we filmed the whole thing. And uh, just to put a punctuation point on it, I said that we shipped there from 2002 to 2008. In 2008, after several years of shipping and doing a lot of business and, and building my factory, um, all of the containers got seized, and the Egyptian government said that this was e-waste, that this was polluting, this was going to be burned. So I went over for a farewell visit. You know, Ami says it's not worth it. But he says, Mubarak is trying to put the genie back in the bottle. He says it's too late. That the government was not trying to control pollution. They were trying to control affordable containers. But it was too late. What happened? Hmm? What happened after that? Uh, well, what happened after that? That that's a great segue. This factory right here. What I figured out. I said, Hamdi, 
I can sell you some refurbished ones because I deal with this factory in, uh, this one's in Indonesia, the next slide's in uh, 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 Penang, Malaysia. I said, these are the factories that used to make the CRT monitors. They made them, you know, tens of thousands uh, a week back in the 90s. And I know these guys, they're now buying used ones. And they refurbished them and put them back into a brand new case. And they look like new. I said, what we'll do is I'll send from Middlebury to uh, Malaysia. They'll refurb them, put them brand new in a box with uh, Arabic lettering. Hamdi the Abacus says, da, 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 those will cost me $33. It's 25% uh, the cost of a new one, but it's still too high for the Egyptian market. I said, Hamdi, it was too high last month when you could buy the used working ones from me. But are they just enforcing this law against you, or are they enforcing it against everybody? He said, they're enforcing it against everybody. I said, I think the price of monitors is going to go up. And he said, you're right. <laughs> so what we did was, for the next two years, shipped all the monitors from Middlebury. We took a price cut versus if we'd sold it direct. But we shipped them to these factories in Malaysia, where they refurbed them, brought them to a new in box condition, just like a brand new one, brand new plastic and everything. And we sold uh, new computers, not used ones, to Egypt for uh, two more years. So did the buyers know that they were used or refurbished? I don't know. You know, they, uh, some of them probably did, some of them probably didn't. You know, they had Arabic, they, they worked 25 years. I mean, they're not, um, it really makes no sense to mint a brand new CRT today that's going to last 25 years. I mean, selling them right now for $20 when they'll last 10 years is probably more appropriate than selling them for 150 when they'll last 25 years. But anyway, I'll try to move on to have more questions. This is Mexico. I decided I was fighting, beating my head against the wall with this group, Basil Action Network. At the beginning, we tried dealing with them. Uh, we were actually in Middlebury, where their main place to call if someone wanted to sign their pledge. They say, Robin, is this guy okay or not? And I was cooperating with them. We even published some papers together. But uh, they wouldn't let go of this campaign of showing primitive children burning all the stuff. I said, look, that's just really not accurate. And they said, well, it's not accurate, but technically it should be illegal under the Basel Convention. They believe that just any time you have rich people trading with poor, that it's unfair and imbalanced trade, and that it's going to go wrong. So that's why they campaigned for it to be illegal. So my idea was, I said, well, what if I do it in Mexico? Because Mexico's OECD, it's NAFTA, there's no, nothing international law against that. But I know from being in Mexico that there's places in the Sonoran Desert which are poorer than any place in Africa, or than at least a lot of places in Africa. So I opened this place, uh, uh, people, a maquila in Mexico uh, five years ago, four years ago. Um, and people said, well, the maquilas, those exploit women. So I'm like, okay, I'll partner with the women's club. And the uh, chicas will be in charge. They'll hire the men and they can fire anybody that's bad. And so it's all these uh, ladies that are in their 40s and 50s because they get fired from other jobs in Mexico when you reach that age. They're the ones who own and run the plant. And, uh, We'll show them, we did training for, with them in Middlebury, it came up, it was kind of funny. You know, living in my, my house, my wife said, what are you doing? Uh, you know, all these people coming through, they were there actually at the same time as some of the Africans and Egyptians and stuff. It was quite a party, but we've opened a plant for them in Mexico where they use the same hand methods of disassembly as we use in Middlebury. Um, the refurbishment is still what I love, uh, the big secret factories, um, uh, were the ones that uh, made these monitors to begin with. They were replacing the uh, the brand new mint virgin tubes were about 110 bucks. So when they can buy a used one that's got 10 more years on it for 10 bucks, that's how they, they were making the affordable computers. Uh, we do purchase orders, we track the overseas shipments, we hire auditors, we make them get ISO 14001, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but we still, we're, that, that's at the top end, which are the factories that used to make them, and we know can make them for places like Egypt. But at the same time, we want the recycling infrastructure to be there, because that's the other big secret that's come out in the last month. This whole story that sea containers are what's being filmed in Guayu. 60 Minutes spoke to me for two hours, and they owe me an apology. 
because I showed them the, the pictures of the factory that was buying the monitors they circled in Hong Kong. And I said, if you do the math, there's no money in this in your store. I said, yes, there's electronic junk in Guayu. Guayu is the dump of the Shenzhen, Guangzhou, Hong Kong metropolis, which has a population bigger than Japan. And there's people, there's monorails and, and stuff. And yes, there's very poor people, but Guayu is the dump of that megacity. And when you say you're following the trail, you're not following the trail. Um, but what they should have announced, what they did uncover, is that it has now been codified that um, uh, most of the junk in Africa or in China that's been filmed was generated there. If it was imported, it was used for 10 years. They use it to the bone. You know, but now uh, five UN studies have done what we predict. We predicted it based on the price to get a C container of uh, TVs or monitors from Middlebury to uh, uh, Dakar, Senegal, which we filmed. It's on YouTube to show what happens. We documented with Suleiman, the guy doing the buying, and he was even pickier than Hamdi. You know, what he wanted, he was showing us that it cost him $19 every seat on the container. By the time he buys it, pays for the shipping, pays bribes to get it through customs, gets it to his store, he said if he gives it away at that point, he's lost $19. But it only has $3.50 in scrap. So he showed us with the math what the UN studies have now discovered which is that it was impossible to ship 80% waste. You cannot make money doing that. The UN showed that just free market was about 85% about reuse. 15%, I'm not apologizing for that, but I think that we can fix it with fair trade. Fix it by shipping more, that that would give the buyers more. Uh, anyway, these were our, our actual shipments. Uh, I'll show you guys more if you want. Uh, this is a name for, for us in Middlebury. We sent them down to the Mexico office. Um, uh, and this is Al Wahab, who lives here in uh, Burlington. You might see him around from time to time. He spends about half of his uh, year up here testing the computers, packing them up for container. So he sends them to Ghana, and then the other half of the year he spends in Ghana fixing them up, distributing them, and trading them. He flies back to Middlebury, and we ask him, you know, take a picture of whatever's not working, let us make it right for you, and uh, it's great. So the, the, the big picture is it's like any other prohibition, war on drugs. If you've got, you know, these uh, factories, there were 14 of them uh, uh, in 2005 that were buying the largest one, 5,000 monitors per day, you know, that were behind a lot of the trade. And they got to where they said, well, yeah, we, we're not making the junk in Guayu, but we're so hungry for these things, we're making so much money that we're closing one off. And what they introduced me to, they flew over, they had their attorney from uh, Columbia University, educated woman you know, from China, who says, we need 80,000 per month, just at her factory. Right now we're buying them from people, we used to get them from California. California banned all export of all monitors because California said that we're primitive and ride on bicycles and we break them with hammers. So all of the ones that we used to buy this 80,000 per month from California is now illegal. California is taxing taxpayers to break it. So we're trying to replace the supply by coming to the East Coast. And we're having to buy from Al Capone, from this guy who's my arch competitor down in New Jersey. And I said, he's awful. He, he fills the containers with 30% bad ones. He says, I'm not giving you the good ones unless you take the TVs, you know, fixed in that we don't want. So they said, we're stuck because we've got a factory with these jobs. We've got demand you know, in places like Egypt and India which want to get on the internet. We can't just turn off, we run three ships a day, seven days a week. We can't just turn off the lights and go home, Rob. What can we do? And what we wanted to do with them then was if we get enough good people to embrace the idea of fair trade recycling, we'll have enough supply that you won't have to buy from them. You'll be able to get what you, you need and negotiate with him if he doesn't take the junk out, that you can still feed your factory with the good ones. And that's how WR3A would eliminate, you know, this kind of shows how the way they were buying from him, that they were winding up with 30% bad ones per month. Um, Is that uh, TAR? Oh, toxics along for the right. 
that's, uh, sorry, that's my uh, and that's the last slide, so I'll be, I'll be able for questions. So can you, I know you tried to do a little bit, but so can you just kind of walk us through the process from start to finish? Cause that's a little bit. So you get the, the and you, you were just talking about monitors, but you work with other equipment as well. So yeah. Like, okay. So you get the used equipment from UVM, Champlain, and you take it to your factory and then what happens. Then we take, uh, this is what Adelaide is, is studying, our, our intern from Paul Zizan University in uh, France with that interns from the University of Amsterdam as well for six months, uh, University of Guadalajara. And what they do is observe it. Uh, what we do is we have to remove about 70% of what we get, usually because they're too large or too old. We take them apart. That lady's done it with screws. Um, and we don't use shredders. Because I know the shredding business, it's, it, manual disassembly is better. You wind up with cleaner product, cleaner plastic, the aluminum, the copper. And what I observed in Indonesia and Malaysia, they even take out heat sinks you know, and individual components from the board that they recognize are value-added products that they'll put on a new board again. So hand disassembly, that's what we're training the women to do in Mexico, is that you beat the shredder because what the American systems do is they're trying to eliminate the labor costs by grinding it up. And Adelaide just went to go visit one in uh, uh, Montreal. Maybe she can talk about it. But that what I argue is that as long as the people are given protective working equipment, they're paid, not, you know, not to burn it. You know, burning wire just makes it lighter. If you just pay as much for insulated wire as for burned wire, that they'll stop doing it. Um, hand disassembly is good, and that's what we do in Middlebury. We don't have any shredders, um, and it's very high employment situation. It's tough for me to compete. But that 25% that we don't take apart is worth 75% the money. So we hire, you know, uh, we've got 25 at Middlebury, 10 in Mexico. They take, most of those people are taking the bad pieces apart. Recycling the plastic over here, the black plastic over there, the circuit boards, and we do an end downstream end market on everything. But that 25% that is either working or more often, they have a specification that they care more about something else than they care about whether it's working. You know, a good tech is going to prefer, any good tech is going to prefer a non-working um, Lenovo uh, 2008 uh, ThinkPad to an e-machine that's, that's working. What, what they know is the capacitors actually is the huge thing. Have you heard of the capacitor play? Uh, a whole bunch of bad circuit boards got made by Intel during this third or four year period in China, where the capacitors overheated and popped, and Americans were throwing the whole computer away. And they opened factories in Taiwan, but they couldn't believe it. They were getting these, and they knew exactly which capacitor burned out, which was the bad one, and they're just taking all these ones with burned capacitors, putting in new ones for 50 cents and having a $400 computer. So we try to learn what the buyer wants, teach our staff the specs to get it for them. And we don't pretend that we know more than they do. You know, we don't insist, no, this one's working, take it, take it, you like it. You know, they, they tell us what we want, and then we get a certification back from them exactly what percentage that they weren't able to do. And then we pay them to do the same process, manual disassembly, of their bad ones that we do. And then what happens, so then you have, you're left with 25% and the 25% and the 75% ends up with, there's an end process for it with the 75%. And the 25 all gets exported. And how does the fair trade work into it? Well, the fair trade is uh, a response to the no export bans. There's California pass that's been introduced as legislation for the United States to ban all export of use computers to places like Africa and Indonesia. So and fair trade is a that, response to that. Okay, so the idea behind that is because we don't want to be polluting their countries with our rates. Right. So, the, so there's good intention behind the bills. It's just something lost in the situation when you think about your company because you're the one that's doing it. Right. 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 Right.
it, it was, I would say it's good intentions 10 years ago, probably still good intentions five years ago. If you look at who the funders are, they're the same people as the Anti-Gray Market Alliance. That it's that. it's uh, people that don't like used products being resold in their markets. Um, money is coming in from manufacturers, um, like ink cartridges. You know, if you hear on the Diane Rehm show, a guy from NRDC talking about how, oh, none of the ink cartridges should be refilled. They crush them and only recycle the plastic. I mean, that's idiotic. Ink cartridges, there's nothing poison about filling ink cartridges. What they don't like about exporting empty ink cartridges is that they're selling full ones for $22. And the folks in China are filling the empty ones and making them like new no, and selling them for $40. So what has finally happened after years of us arguing that the statistic of 80% burning was wrong, finally, just in the last year, five studies funded by the Basel Secretariat have shown that 85% of the exports to Africa were in fact reduced. So what we've got, to, so what Fair Trade says is, honestly find out what's driving the export. Is it waste being burned? How much of it is bad? You know, the 15%, be transparent about it, be fair, either find a way to, to eliminate that, or if you can't, sometimes you can't, it's an elective upgrade. This is where I was got into a big fight with Basil Action Network, that he said, well, I don't like that those factories are turning them into new ones because they're taking parts out that they recycle, and that those parts that they're replacing I'm like, yeah, but that's an elective upgrade. If I send him a 512 RAM, and the kid pulls the 512 and puts a gig in there, I can't legislate against that. <laughs> you know, so at a certain point, because more of the waste is being produced over there, and because they're going to have elective upgrades, it makes sense to financially teach them or pay them, you know, to do the same manual disassembly process and proper recycling that we do. So with California, for example, where is their stuff going right now? If there's a ban of exporting any of it, where where does it wind up? It gets uh, shredded, like the place that uh, Adelaide went to visit in Montreal. They run through a big mechanical shredder, um, and what, what California does is taxes new ones. They don't actually make it illegal to export, but they pay so much, 48 cents a pound, to redeem it through the system that there's no incentive you know, to sell it for, for $5 at the state will pay you uh, $18 to break it. So um, they've just automated, they do that 75% bad really well in California. It's just they don't get the 25% good. So then what happens to the shredded material? Uh, it gets sorted by hand, the same as if you would have used screwdrivers to begin with. I mean, the magnets will take out the steel, the eddy currents will take out the aluminum. It's a little bit of a, I, I was a little bit superficial there, but I do feel that um, we've romanticized a labor-saving device with shredders, and that if you actually do a mass balance. And just this month, we issued a challenge to a, a group in California uh, uh, through University of Santa Cruz and USC to hold a, a massive e-waste collection in California, and we'll have the technicians at iFixIT divide everything into two equal piles. You know, blind to which pile goes where. You know, just take everything and just as equal. If you put one smartphone here, try to put one smartphone there. And then we'll draw straws. So no one knows which pile they're getting. Draw straws, send one pile through the California system and track it, you know, so we can answer this question. And send the other pile to Chica's Province, to the women in Mexico, and see what they do by hand. And you know, then if I'm wrong, if it turns out that the Chicas can't deal with it or whatever, let's document that. You know, if California lines up, whoops, smartphone went through the shredder. There, there goes you know three hundred dollars. Um, you know, then we'll document that. But what I object, what we are trying to do with fair trade is to take this Willie Horton campaign off of the geeks of color. It's the technicians over there that are repairing the cell phones and repairing the laptops you know more than anybody in this room does about what they want and what they can do. And they're generating great jobs. They're developing economies that become places like Singapore. And to see them over and over again, 
described with these pictures, these 10-year-old pictures of children that are picked up and put on piles of junk, it's, it's just insulting. So what is the, you know, thinking about that, because, you know, I think a lot of us do have that image, and think about the Greenpeace video of, you know, the people in India sitting in the trash heap and using acid in open air and putting down grain. What's the percentage that that, that is actually happening as compared to the people that you work with? Uh, I guess the question is which part of what is happening, and that's where what Adelaide's doing. I said, you know, take a monitor and take it apart. And you know, once she does it, she shows the amount of time to do it. You can identify what the materials of concern are or the focus materials. Bad CRTs really have no value. It's it it's a huge temptation, you know, to do what the Al Capone guy in New Jersey was doing, my competitor. You know, saying what. Well, I'm not giving you these seven good ones unless you take these three bad ones. That's tremendously tempting. You know, but the, the bad tube is just, it's not really, really toxic, but it doesn't have much value. Um, but that's the first thing is, is to stop. The second thing, the acid burning, it's a cash flow problem. Because if you take the boards and you actually send them to Dawa in Japan, uh, they've got rare earth metals. Proper recycling pays twice as much as the acid burning. The acid burning is because it, it winds up in a place, this slum outside, like the Darwai slum outside of Mumbai, or the uh, Waiyu slum outside of uh, uh, Shenzhen, where at least 10 years ago, Waiyu, and I'll get to where they actually are now. You know, I, I think that part of what was going on was even if you could get paid, uh, uh, twice as much by sending it for proper recycling, you can't wait on the cash flow. You know, at a certain point, you've got to feed your kids, you've got to, you know, pay electricity bills or whatever, and so the, the acid thing, um, to get the gold, even if you're only getting 50% of the gold out, you get it out faster. So that was another thing we identified is, maybe through Kiva Loan, set up something where the people can get paid credit on how many boards they've stored, it should fund itself because the boards are going to be worth twice as much as if they treat them in acid. Uh, oh, and the second half of the acid bath is that most of what they show you pictures of isn't what's going on. Uh, Adam Minter of Bloomberg Magazine uh, just did a big report on us. He visited a, uh, a factory in, in uh, Malaysia that we sent him to. Based on that, he revisited Wally the second time. And I said, look for the chips. I said, what I observed going on over there are that the chips in it, they're cutting them off. And when they show the heating and the solder, that's to pull the chips off. Because they are selling the chips. This one to the clock radio factory for 75 cents. This one over to the uh, sign shop. And Adam just wrote back uh, to me uh, two months ago. He said, yeah, you're right. He said, there's a massive a uh, three-story shop in the center of Guayu, which just trades in the chips. There's a great uh, place called Tech Travels Blog, uh, T-E-C-H, yeah, Tech Travels Blog. If you look it up, somebody not in my field, but they just like techs, and they follow like where the cell phones are going, and what looks at the first few slides, like, oh, this is one of those primitive wire burning ladies. Once he spent actually 40 pictures, it shows, by the end of it, she's got a microscope out and is pulling chips out and repairing uh, cell phone boards by the component. So if you give them, if they, you let them keep that job and not call it gray market, not try to put them out of business as a competitor, but let them keep that value. But pay for the proper management of the leftover so that they don't burn it. You know, that, that would be the fair trade. Um, those are really the two and, and then the, the lead, when they talk about the lead in kids' bloodstreams, that comes from electric grade wiring. That's from the wiring, the three-phase current wiring off this building, buildings. We know that here because we've got the same lead soil repair rates in uh, West Texas. That's from massive piles of wire cabling, insulated wire cabling, the big heavy stuff, which when they set fire, that's the stuff that's got the lead in it. That's where the lead and the ash came from. It doesn't come from computers at all. So yeah, transparency, study, get engineers, and you know, tell the truth. And it's not all perfect. It's not like, oh, export's wonderful. 
you know, th there are problems, but if you treat it like a, you know, like a partner, that you can figure out how to fix that 30% that's, that's ugly without telling them, go be barefoot and pregnant, without telling them, uh, 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 you're stupid, primitive people, you know, and without, you know, advertising this thing that, you know, ignores the, the really beautiful things about the high-tech economies over there. Yeah. Um, are the sales of the recycled computers competing with the sales of new computers in those countries? Big time. Yeah. And um, that's where the, the term gray market, it's like the guy with the capacitors that I mentioned, Dell alone had $350 million in recalls from those bad capacitors. And Dell's got its own refurb brand if you go to Dell online. What Dell did was they were shipping them to Taiwan, where one of the, because you know Dell doesn't make anything? Does everybody here know that? The Apple doesn't, there's no Apple factory, there's no Dell factory. I kind of assume everybody knows that. Foxconn, I mean, there's a factory in Shenzhen called Foxconn, Hanhai Group, uh, which makes everything, all the smartphones for everybody. They've got, you know, one, and I saw that with the monitors. At, at this monitor factory, it was the, the same thing, you know. Uh, in, when I went there the first time, they were still making new ones. Morning shift, they were making HP. Afternoon shift, making Dell. Third shift, they were making their own. So what, what happened is the, uh, some of those factories, Dell was sending back the bad ones and then selling them online. But they found that those guys were selling even more of them than they were sending back to Dell. And then Dell sold, uh, sued them. If you Google uh, Dell versus Tiger Direct, it's a lawsuit over how those little 50 cent capacitors were replaced in all the computers that Dell had repo. So yeah, they do compete. So how do you use your company generate revenue? So does UVM and Champlain pay you to take your electronics? Or do you, how does that work? It, it, yeah, good question. I mean, when I entered the market, the, the, there was a big divide. There's the guy in New Jersey that was taking for free or charging a lot less. And then there were the e-steward companies that were shredding stuff and charging a lot more. And so what we tried to do is say, look, we'll charge half as much as the stewards, but we, we can't charge as little as the sprint. You know, but if, and what we found when we developed the network was that there was a price point, you know, 10 years ago where for most people, if it's five to $10 a piece, most people would rather just pay it and, and feel good about it, you know, than, than argue and only pay two dollars, you know, because you only throw one out once every, uh, you know, four or five years. And so we, we found that more people were willing if we if we explained to them and were transparent, and showed the pictures and showed our numbers. This is how many they, we export. Look at how many people we employ. Look at how many they're taking apart. Obviously, they're not taking them apart at random. And we're not randomly saying, exporting 30%, that would be stupid. You know, there's the guy who tests it. And what we found is people like Erica Spiegel at UVM said, this makes a lot of sense. You know, this, you know, I trust you and this doesn't look stupid. And then by working with, you know, and then Dartmouth University got on. And that those people helped us build clients at Chipman County, Addison County, and now we're in Boston and Long Island. And that's one reason why we like visitors and we like debate. And you know, part of our recipe for people to trust us is to ask us hard questions. You know, for us to go and, and, and get get the answer. Does the, the, your supply come mostly from institutions or from individuals as well? Mostly from individuals these days. Um, the great big 32 inch CRT TVs is a lot of the volume. Uh -huh. And that, that was the Peruvian case? Uh, those are winding up in Peru? Well, some, those really are only at about a 5 to 10% reuse rate right now. We, we sell them in Mexico and Peru, but um, there's just so many, many of them that we wind up taking most of those apart uh, just because the, the market's flooded. Also, 
we, we were shipping more of them, like 25% of them we were selling uh, 10 years ago, but the price of the flat TVs just keeps falling. And uh, I, I don't know how much more life there is in that market. So the business model for you is to disassemble and, and, and get paid for the, the, the scrap? Yeah, we make uh, uh, roughly one third of the money comes from the scrap, the plastic, the copper, etc. One third comes from resale of that 25% of displays or PCs, and one third comes from the fees. And that's nice for us too because it's a diversified income stream. You know, we've seen companies that try to rely on all scrap values. A lot of those companies got really hurt in 2009. Um, a lot of the shredding companies wound up in trouble because uh, the commodities were way down. And actually how we survived, well, I almost, our company almost went down. What we did was uh, started buying the CRT monitors from all the other recyclers. We found one market that was still going, which were these factories. And so I started flying around the country buying from Indiana and North Carolina, marking up a dollar to sell to these guys, and that's how we made it through the, the recession.